what's good josh it's boy ross back at again with another video so we're gonna check out 10 lamest ways wrestlers won championships this should be a very interesting video man it's always a good uh feeling for the fans when you uh you invested in someone climbing to the top trying to become a new champion in whatever the mid card division the upper top card or the tag team division wherever you want these individuals to win the championship you know all right that's awesome you know they they work their hardest to overcome the odds and you know and they finally get that big moment and it's it's a good feeling and then there can be some times where you know it just doesn't make sense it don't hit it so you're just like that's how they win that's 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 it or maybe a a, a heel wins a championship and you're just like huh so that's how they become champions couldn't have come up with nothing better or it becomes anticlimactic like oh i was expecting a little bit more you know sometimes these things happen so this should be an interesting one i want to see some of these some of these i may have seen before some of these uh i may not have seen before so it should be a good one appreciate all love and support by uh cultaholic wrestling been subscribed to them for a while now let's get right into this one see some of these lame championship victories different ways to win a pro wrestling championship belt pinfall submission knockout climbing a ladder putting someone through a table all worthy methods of picking up the gold i'm sure you'll agree not these methods though these ones suck a big fat one <laughs> wrestling history is full of performers capturing titles in rotten ways and we are here to celebrate the very best of the very worst. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these one. are the 10 lamest ways wrestlers won championships. Join us. Number 10, winning a fictional tournament. We are starting mm. this list with literally the oldest trick in WWE's book. When Vince McMahon Sr. and Toots Mond broke away from the National Wrestling Alliance in 1963, they needed a champion to represent their new promotion. Their choice was Buddy Rogers, the former NWA champ, but just how were the company going to get their belt onto him? With an actual tournament? No, stupid. With a made-up one, of course. Rogers was crowned <laughs> the first ever WWWF champion, as it was known at the time, wow. by beating Antonino Rocca in the finals of a fictional tournament in Rio de Janeiro. Why Rio? Who knows? Maybe the promoters thought it was far enough away that nobody would question it? 16 years later, WWE pulled this stunt again when Pat Patterson won another fake tournament in Rio to become the first ever intercontinental champion. Wow. At least this time, there was the pretense that he had unified the existing North American title with the fictional South American one. These fake brackets are now heavily ingrained in WWE's mythos, but that doesn't change the fact that neither of these men actually beat any Anyone to win their respective belts. Number nine, oh, wow. <laughs> pinning Vince McMahon. On the September 16th, 1999 Didn't episode I know of that at all. Vince McMahon beat Triple H to become world champion of his own promotion. Yeah. And people say Vince has an ego problem. McMahon vacated the belt just four days later, meaning that he was never pinned to lose the championship. Weirdly enough, though, he was pinned to lose somebody else that same title the following year. King of the Ring 2000 was head lined by a six-man tag pitting WWE Champion Triple H and Vincent Shane McMahon against The Rock and the Brothers of Destruction. The rule was that whoever got the pin for the babyface side would become champion, no matter which of their opponents they beat. Sounds a tad unfair, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Vince, who was about two months away from his 55th birthday, was correctly identified as the weakest link in this match. The chairman foolishly went for his own version of the people's elbow, but was scooped up by the great one and planted with a rock bottom for the one, two, three. Congratulations, Rock. You won the belt by pinning a middle-aged non-wrestler. <laughs> you feel great about yourself. Number eight, pinning... Yeah, I, I get when you really break it down, but obviously, you know... People love to see Vince get beat up, so it was like, okay. Like, people would give that a pass because Vince was such a a deplorable character on screen and possibly off screen that uh <laughs> that people love seeing him get beat. So it it back then it, it if it was a rock and stone cold beating Vince McMahon, 
even though that doesn't make sense for you to become the new champion, it didn't matter. They, they, they could do no wrong with those two guys. <laughs> Eric Bischoff, just a couple of months before The Rock pinned Vince McMahon to win the WWE title, fading rival promotion WCW pulled a similar stunt with their version of the genetic jackhammer. On the April 25th, 2000 edition of Thunder, a tag team match was scheduled where whoever got the winning pinfall would become the WCW World Heavyweight Champion. In one corner was former champion Jeff Jarrett and WCW bigwig Eric Bischoff. In the other was reigning champion Diamond Dallas Page and his partner... Oh no, not him. Oh, not man. David Arquette. Jesus. The star of Scream had been pulled into WCW's <laughs> orbit through the cinematic mark. Oh my god, that, that was a thing, y'all. <laughs> that was a thing. I forgot that was a thing. <laughs> masterpiece that was ready to rumble. Arquette's character in that film gets covered with raw sewage, which is still a hundred times better than what went down on Thunder. After some typical WCW nonsense, Arquette pinned Bischoff at the same time as Jarrett pinned DDP. The referee then had to crawl past Jarrett to count the three for the <laughs> film star who was your new WCW champion. Oh, awful, what makes bro. this even worse is that Paige then celebrated with Arquette, despite the fact that he had just lost the world title. I'm sorry, but that's just, that's just, that's just funny booking, bro. Just... It's so awful, it's funny. <laughs> you walk in with someone, you still want to keep your title, right? And then you lose to the person you walk in with to only raise their hand. Like, yeah, bro, you did it. What? <laughs> sometimes I miss WCW. Sometimes I'm glad they're dead. Number seven, hot potato with a pensioner. Hot potato with a pensioner sounds like the title on a very specific kind of website. No king Whoa. shaming from me, you do you, pal. What we're referring to is that time in 1999 when actually good wrestler Ivory lost her WWE Women's Championship to the 76-year-old Fabulous Moolah. And no mercy 1999, the old biddy pulled off the upset of the century by pinning Ivory in a title match. I use the word upset because that's what everybody was after the bell had rung. Moolah, <laughs> who was born in the same month that the Hollywood sign was erected, had been a star back in her day. Jesus Christ. Damn. <laughs> but this was far from her day. She held the belt for just over a week before Ivory won it back on Raw. Honestly, Ivory was a fantastic wrestler who was way ahead of her time. Unfortunately, though, that was apparently a massive disadvantage as she was stuck doing bollocks like this when she should have been stealing the show like the female workers of today. Yeah. Did she gain anything at all by beating a woman old enough to be her grandma? No, no, she didn't. No yeah. wonder she joined Right to Censor the following year. Number six, <laughs> finding it in a bag. WrestleMania 15, Shane McMahon versus X-Pac for the European Championship. The DX member looks like he's about to dethrone Shane when Triple H does the unthinkable and turns on his little pal. Mm -hmm. The shock, the horror, the betrayal. After narrowly escaping with the belt, Shane O'Mac decided that he wanted to retire it as undefeated champion. And that was the end for the European title, until about three months later. On the June 21st, 1999 edition of Raw, Midian of the corporate ministry misplaced his belt. Asked his boss Shane if he could borrow a belt that he had found in his bag, which the young McMahon agreed to. That belt would just so happen to be the reactivated European Championship. Midian actually held the gold for a month before dropping it to D'Lo Brown at the fully loaded pay-per-view. I'm sure D'Lo loved that he'd just won a belt off a guy who found it by mistake. <laughs> oh, well, at least the belt wasn't in the trash or anything like that. No company could possibly be that stupid. There's... <laughs> it just happened to find this belt back here. Let's... Let's fight for it. <laughs> it's number five, finding it in a bin. And we're back to WCW. The WCW World Television Championship could trace its roots back to the NWA in the early 1970s. It was held by some of the greatest performers of all time, including Steve Austin, Ricky Steamboat, Rowdy Roddy Piper, Dusty Rhodes, and Ric Flair. Scott Hall won the belt off Rick Steiner at Mayhem 1999 when, eight days later, he decided that he was bored with this historic championship and so gave it to Kevin Nash, who promptly chucked it in the bin. 
Then in February of 2000, Hacksaw Jim Duggan was going through a dumpster, don't ask, when he found the title and decided to keep it. Let's break this down. Nash binned the belt in Denver, Colorado, whilst Duggan found it in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Those two <laughs> cities are 1,731 miles apart, so how the hell did that happen? <laughs> the way in which Duggan lost the belt also sucked, as he was stripped of the title during the Great Champion Reset brought about by Eric Bischoff and Vince Russo. The title was promptly forgotten about, never to be seen on TV ever again. Damn, bro. You throw away the belt to only find it in a whole nother city across the country only for it to be stripped away anyway that's cold the lens of the belt don't mean nothing once someone throws it in the trash that lets you know how they felt number four picking it out of a random box Every so often, a new wrestling stipulation comes around that changes the way the sport operates forever. Mm -hmm. The Lockbox 8 Knockout Elimination Tag Team match was not one of them. On the April 5th, 2010 episode of TNA Impact, eight women squared off in a, shall we say, unique match type. If you eliminated someone, then they would have to leave the ring, but so would you. Right. The four women who scored elimination would be granted a key. Each key corresponded to a mysterious box. Wait, One I'm con Wait, what is what? So if you eliminate someone, you're eliminated too? Up. And what, what is these boxes? Strip tease? The title up? So what? One of which had the knockouts championship inside. Not only did you not have to be on the winning team to win this match, but you could also be a winner and still not become champion? Right! The four survivors were current champion Tara, Angelina Love, Velvet Sky, and Daphne. Sky won a contract for a match of her choice, Daphne won the opportunity to do a strip tease, and Tara was thrilled when she found out her box contained her missing tarantula. But wait, that means she's just lost the title. What is going on? Love's crate was the one with the belt in it, meaning that she was the new champ. Unfortunately for her, nobody really cared anymore. Number three, having your drink. Who? Who? I don't even need to say nothing. I'm, I'm too many questions that will never get answered. Dress removed. Wrestlers removing each other's clothes to win a match is a time-honored tradition. We've seen it with tuxedos, with bras and panties, uh, and with whatever the hell Patterson and Briscoe were wearing in their hardcore evening gown match. Geez. I guess they were evening gowns, but still. Ugh. WWE decided to change this formula up for the May 10th episode of Raw in 1999. Although they didn't tell anybody beforehand that that was what they were going to do. Deborah was facing Sable for the latter's women's championship in an evening gown match. After a few seconds of action, Sable ripped off her opponent's dress and successfully retained her title. Or did she? Out came Shawn Michaels, who was WWE Commissioner at the time. He announced that, in his eyes, it was the woman who had her dress taken off that was the actual winner. He then announced Deborah as the new women's champion. Remember, dear viewers, if you want to be a champion, you could work hard and give it your all, or you could just look good in a set of skin piece. That's what? the moral here. What? Number two, getting kicked in the nuts. She, I'm so, well, actually, she, she more naked right now and she look good. So I'm going to give her the championship. Wait, what? Different time in wrestling. <laughs> he may seem pretty chill these days, but there was a time where Randy Orton was a very angry snake. Orton often struggled to control his temper, both behind the scenes and on camera. Mm -hmm. You only have to ask Kofi Kingston about that. The Viper's anger management issues were woven into his character and played an important role in several of his high-profile feuds, including when he was battling Christian over the World Heavyweight Championship mm -hmm. in 2011. The Apex Predator had beaten Christian mere days after he won the title in the wake yep. of Edge's retirement. This led to a match between the two at Money in the Bank, with the stipulation that if Randy got too angry and got disqualified, then Christian, Christian would yep. become the champion. And guess what happened? Captain Charisma wound Orton up so much that he flew completely off the rails. After Christian span his face, yeah. the champion punted his opponent right in the knackers to lose the match and the title via mm -hmm. DQ. Christian Cage, an absolutely <laughs> excellent, highly decorated wrestler, won his final world title in WWE by getting kicked in the plums. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I, I get the story that they were telling. I, I can see how someone would uh it, it 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 is kind of a weird way 
for him to win it like that because it's like, damn, bro, he really won the title because old dude couldn't control his temper. I mean, granted, you spit in my face. I mean, I'm going to just beat the brakes out of you. So the title is already out the question now. Now it's going to be like, I know I'm going to have to process in my mind like, okay, I'm going to lose the title because I'm about to send this man to the upper room. But it depends on how much damage I can do to him to the point where he has to forfeit the title because he's going to be injured and he won't be able to compete. That would be my mission now is to put you on a shelf so you can't even defend the title. You have to relinquish it. So nobody wins. <laughs> Number one, a present from Eric Bischoff. When WWE unified their world title with WCW's in 2001, they created one undisputed championship that would float between both Raw and mm -hmm. SmackDown. Love that belt That design. was, of course, until Brock Lesnar took the belt to the blue brand and refused to give it back. This yeah. left Raw GM Eric Bischoff in quite the pickle. He needed a new belt and he needed it fast. Oh, Luckily, yeah. he remembered he had one sitting in his attic. On September 2nd, and 2002, just gave it to Bischoff H. reintroduced the world to the big gold belt. This beautiful piece of history would now be called the World Heavyweight Championship and be exclusive to Monday Ain't nights. Yep. So how would the first ever champion be, be crowned? Great, yep. A grueling tournament? A mammoth Iron Man match? A hot dog eating contest? Nope. Nah, let's just give it a give triple, triple H, H and be done with it. In a shocking move, Bischoff just went, here you go, and handed the game the belt. He didn't have to do anything, and he was the new world champion. How is that fair? Nah. We know wrestling is scripted, but you could have at least put some effort in, guys. Yeah. Hell, a fake tournament in Rio de Janeiro would have sufficed. I remember when that happened, and this is when people were really, is that, that, Triple H reign of terror was true, bro. They literally gave him the title. I can understand if he went through a situation we knew he was going to win like a tournament or whatever. No, they said, here, new belt, have it. They literally gave him the title, bro. Deadass gave him the title. I'm just like... that. I'm okay with that being number one. That is the... Bro, that's, that's awful. That's still one of the worst booking decisions they ever did. <laughs> which is handing Triple H the World Heavyweight Championship just because. Yep, I'm agreeing with that. Comment down below, let me know. Hey, for those who watch TNA, what the hell was that damn match? Like, I need a backstory on that. For those who watch TNA at that point and know that match, please let me know what the hell was that, who booked that. I'm, I'm so confused because the him explaining it and then actually watching the what went down like in uh, how the process went it just it made no sense actual made no sense so if you guys have a better understanding of that match for those who watched tna at that point let me know explain to me what the hell that was all about but i appreciate all the love and support you guys showing on channel road to 150k and i'm still getting the speed of youtube wrestling champion world appreciate y'all keeping me see you on the next one peace